So thank you to the Tobago Commission for inviting me. I'm very excited to share some of the stuff that we've been doing with deep learning future representations for the cross of the images and how we use an unsupervised deep learning for that purpose. Um, so in general, I study microscopy images, and the reason I'm interested in them is because microscopy images contain this biology. You can tell so many things just by looking at them. For example, you can tell what drugs um, a character has been, um, have been doing with. You can analyze some cell group, um, if you look at them, you can see where the protein is localized within the cell. And they're even used for diagnostics. For example, um, one of the ways that people diagnose cancer is that they look at the rate of mitosis within um, the body images. Now, these are all qualitative insects. How do we actually turn them into quantitative insects so we can measure and automate some of the biological processes that we do when we look at microscopy images? So, the standard way that people um, work with microscopy images is that they will turn them into features as a way to quantitate the biology within these images. So, your standard pattern will look like this. You start out with the images, and then you apply some pre processing. You segment the single cells, or you may put up the illumination. But the goal of that is to extract a set of numbers that represent the biology that you're interested in setting. So, for example, you might measure the area of the cells, you might measure the intensity of your left control. But um, the essential thing then is that uh, once you've um, extracted those numbers, you can apply those numbers to a wide variety of downstream analyses. So, for example, you might want to classify different cells within your, um, within your, um, your data. Um, with, cl with classification, if you can cluster them, if you think of you have a heterogeneous mixture of cells, you can do some type of um, discovery. But the essential thing to keep in mind is, is that no matter what you want to do, the success of your downstream analysis is going to depend on the quality of your features. Your features will be sensitive to the biology that you do want to measure, but they're going to be robust to the stuff that you don't want to measure, the batch effects, so illumination effects. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is convolutional neural networks, and obviously they're very famous these days. But the one thing that I think people tend to miss is that convolutional neural networks automatically low features. So what this means is that if you break open a convolutional neural network and you look at what it's learning under the hood, it's learning to design and extract features in the same way an imaging expert would design and extract features to represent the biology in their images. Um, and since these images are uh, optimized, the features known by CNNs may be more sensitive to biology and robust to nuisance variation than those designed by viral imaging experts. So as proof, I have here two scanning plots, and these are two-dimensional representations of the features learned by a CNN versus the features learned by, um, versus the features extracted by a classical feature extraction um, process. So the, the different colors are different phenotypes in these images, and you can see that the species run by CNN in separate different biological classes, a lot cleaner in the species space than classic features. So this leads us to an actual question then. Can CNNs automatically design features for us? And the short answer is that it's challenging because the feature representation that the CNN learns is dependent on the training problem. So in short, the CNN is only going to learn um, information from the image that it needs to solve its training problem. So what we do know then is that supervised CNNs, so classifiers, tend to learn their features, but unsupervised um, CNNs, so that simple tasks such as reconstructing images, often do not. Now, this is a key critical limitation because supervised CNNs require large manually annotated training for the sets. And you can see that the work people have been doing to collect these training data sets. So, the question I'm going to address today is can we find an unsupervised for training CNNs that still relies on high quality generalizable features? So, the paradigm that we're going to work in is called self supervised learning, and this is a very recent advance in machine learning. Um, and what self supervised learning so proposes is that we're going to place the human labels with some kind of information from the context or the structure of the data that you're working with. Now, in order to do this, we have to change the way we think about CNN a little bit. Now, normally, when you train a machine learning model, you train it to do something that's useful for you, right? Like you train it to classify something to predict, make a prediction that you can use in the end. What self supervised learning says is that it's not the output of the model that's important, but it's the features that the model learns. So it proposes training of a pretext task with which labels can be obtained unsupervised. After training, the output is destroyed, and the training CNN is only used as a feature of the output. So what this means is that when we define a training task for the CNN, we don't have to do something that is useful for us, but have to teach the neural network good features. Now that's a bit abstract, but hopefully I've clarified this in introducing our new um, method, which is called Pixel Inquiry. And what it is is that it's a pretext task for self-supervised learning. 
So you're looking at an image of um, a microscopic image of human cells. And like most microscopic images, there are a lot of different um, genetically identical cells within the image. And these will have similar phenotypes because they've been treated with the same conditions. Um, so um, the blue in this image is the nucleus. The red bit in this image is a marker for the microtubules. And the green in this image is a protein, which in this case we look at the nucleolus. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a random cell from, from this image, we call it a short cell, and we'll show the neural network all three parts of this image, so all three channels. And then we're going to take another random cell from the same image, and then we'll show the neural network just the shape of the cell. So in this sense, we'll show the neural network the green, the, the blue, the nucleus, and then the red, the microtubule channels. And then we'll ask the neural network to be like what it thinks the protein looks like in the second cell. Now, why do we expect this to learn different features? I think this is best explained from human intuition. If I were to show you guys these two images, you'll probably be able to do this task. The way you would do, go about it is that you would look at this image and you go, this person is looking at the nucleus. I know because there's a bunch, bunch of uh, break dots in this image, and then you would know to paint a bunch of um, break dots within the nucleus of the second image, right? We think that the CR9 will have to solve a similar logic in order to solve this problem. And the other thing to emphasize is that this task can be done completely unsupervised. When you pick um, um, our training data, the only constraint is that we have to pick two cells from the same image. So we don't use any human labels or prior knowledge at all, we just use the structure of the image alone. So that's the concept, and here's how you implement it. So this is a conceptual representation of our neural network. And what we're going to do is that we're going to pick two random cells from, from, from the same image and have a, predict, you know, a, predict, a picture of what it thinks the protein localization looks like in the second cell. And then we'll compare that to the real, we'll compare that to the real image, and that's how we try it. We'll do it over and over again for different sets of cells and different images, and then turn the model converges. After training, we're going to isolate the short cell encoder, and then we're going to toss away the rest of the network and then we're just going to use the source cell encoder to extract features. So that is how we get um, unsupervised single cell features using our model. So that was the concept and that was the result, um, um, implementation. Now I want to talk a little bit about the results. So we learned feature representations for three cardinal wide scale data sets. And you can see these are images of different modalities. So we've got two fluorescent images here and one for a field image. They're obviously taken under different microscopes or contributed by different groups and organisms as well. So you've got two um, data sets of yeast cells and then one data set of human cells. Now my goal is to convince you that the method that we've developed can learn single cell representations for all three data sets, despite the fact that they're all very different. And to do this, I'm going to show you a different analysis that we did on each data set to convince you that the features that we learn using this method are very versatile. So the first data set that we're going to be working with is called the GFP-ORF library. And this is associated with the, the publication Charlie Dog. So their goal in this publication is to classify cells based upon the localization of the type protein. So they want to show the model a picture like this, and they want the model to spit out a prediction saying this is a picture of a cell periphery um, model. So they previously used um, um, features that were designed by a viral imaging expert called cell profile features. So this leads us to a natural question then. What would happen if we took these features and we replaced them with our, with our features? How would the classification of a performance of the model change using the, their representation versus ours? And to answer this, we collected a bunch of different unsupervised feature sets and we benchmarked classification performance. So these are the results. We've got a simple classifier on each of the feature sets that we collected. And you can see these are the unsupervised features, and they all achieve about 60 to 70 percent. Now our model achieves 88 uh, percent classification accuracy on this task. And if we compare that to a supervised classifier, that's not that's not default. The supervised classifier performs at 92 to 4 percent, so we're within 4 or 5 percent of the classification of performance. Now the key difference, of course, is that they have to train upon 20,000 images that have manually labeled. We use zero manually labeled images. The second data set that I want to show you is called the NARP1 Promoter or F library. And it's associated with this publication in Nature Method, just, just here. So what these guys did is that they manually annotated the entire library with their current localization by human data. They looked at these images and said, this is the Golgi, this is the mitochondria. Now, 
it's kind of obvious why they did, if looking at the images, why they decided to do this manually. It's, they're not really suited to automated images. They work good images, the cells are clumped, so it's hard to segment, they are overlapping cells, they are mighty out of focus cells, so I think they just gave up on trying to automate this analysis in the first place. So here we've got a simpler question. Can we automatically analyze this data set with pair of cells in painting? So as we before, I joined the model and extracted features using the model, and we added two precise features to each protein. And here's a scatter cut representation of the features, and you can see that the proteins form distinct clusters in the feature space. Now the next thing is, remember I said how they manually annotated the data set? Now if we color this feature space by the manual annotation, you can see that they agree remarkably well with the manual annotation by real law. Now remember, I never showed the model any of these manual annotations on training. This is done completely unsupervised on the image. So somehow, the model is going to form clusters that correspond very well with human annotations. And the nice thing is that when we dug deeper into the representation that the model was learning, it seems to learn an unsupervised map of the yeast cells. So what this means is that the future space will reflect the logical relationships between the organelles. Similar organelles that are closely related to functions, such as the nucleus and the nucleolus, are close in the future space, similar to the backward and backward membrane. Whereas organelles that are um, distinct in the function, their functions, such as the backward membrane and the OL, are separated in the future space. Okay, so the next, last analysis of what I wanted to um, show you is the human data set. So the experiments I've shown you for the two G study sets have shown agreement with pre-existing human labels. Now I want to emphasize that's not the only thing we can do with um, these features. So we ask a different question here. To what extent can tell so implanting users to say that the discovery of new biology? And to answer this, we did an unsupervised flow to cluster analysis of human proteins. So here are the results, and it's visualized with the heat map here. And you can see, so every single protein, every single bone in this um, heat map is a different human protein, and you've got about 12,000 different human proteins here. You can see that the heat map forms the state clusters. I won't have time to go over all of this today, and you can check out our blueprint if you're interested. But um, there's a few highlights. So we find a lot of clusters that correspond to known human organizations. Here are the enrichments and the memberships of um, clusters. But interestingly, we find a lot of clusters that correspond to more specific biological roles. So things like protein complexes or the free ribosome. Now, you can see I've correlated this image kind of carefully, right? I've got the more specific biological role by the medical problem to look at you. But now I look at these images, I can't really see what the difference between the right and left images are, but we think the machine is learning something about these images that's more sensitive than what human eye can do. Now, the last thing I want to talk about are nuclear steps, and these are membranous organelles that form inside the nucleus through phase separation. So, an outstanding question is how many these types of nuclear steps there are? So, proteins tend to re re reside in different nuclear steps. They're very important for a lot of different functions, such as neurological functions, but we don't know what the different types of nuclear steps are. There are visible work dots inside the nucleus in microscopic images, and they're challenging for us to distinguish by human eye. Now, we found two different clusters of nuclear steps. So, a follow up analysis we want to do is do these nuclear stacks seem to reflect different biological growth. So we looked at this in more detail, and you can see right at the bar, they have very different visual details. So the nuclear stacks in cluster D seem to be more final and more diffused within, this, within the nucleus, whereas the nuclear stacks in cluster F seem to form clumps of globules within the nucleus. And that manual assessment is not reliable, but when you look at the enrichment of the new structure, you can see that cluster D is strongly enrichment for the spectrosomal complex, but there's no such enrichment in structure S, which supports the idea that we're finding different subclasses of nuclear steps in our data. In conclusion, I introduced you to a new answer to the task that allows for the learning features completely unsupervised. It can generalize to different diverse data sets. I told you three different data sets, which you apply the features on, and you were able to get very good results on. The features learned through parallel cell implanting outperform other supervised features, and they are applicable for many applications from automating visual analysis to discovering new biology to images. Right, so special thank you to my lab. It's a really great interpose bunch, but also thank you to our collaborators. Um, one of our goals is to make sure this method um, generalizes, and this involves like, getting data from a lot of different sources, so those would not have been quite um, possible without them. And if you're interested, you can check out um, our code and our pre-print archives. So. Um